Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this week's rundown of select headlines from the world of business, investing, and finance. If you're new here, my name is Rakan Kayali, founder of Practical Islamic Finance, where we help people globally build wealth in a halal way. You can follow the crypto and stock portfolios that I manage by becoming a member. Be sure to follow us on social media, including joining our Discord group and signing up to our newsletter. You can also see the list of stocks and cryptos we've reviewed and assigned a comfort level for for free on practicalislamicfinance.com. And links to everything I've just mentioned are in the description of this video. Also, do me a favor and hit the like button for me. Likes are one of the primary metrics YouTube uses to judge whether a channel is producing quality content for its audience and accordingly whether or not they should suggest the channel's videos to more people for viewing. So if you like what we're doing here, hit the like button. It doesn't cost a thing. Obviously, we're going to start our review of recent headlines with Russia's Ukraine invasion, which continues to cause panic in financial markets. The VIX, which is an index measuring volatility and is used as a gauge for the level of fear in financial markets, reached a new year-to-date high of 33. A score below 20 generally indicates investor contentment. A score above 30 suggests anxiety. The VIX tends to have an inverse correlation with the general market. That is, when the market is down, fear is up, and vice versa. As a result of this, buying when the VIX is higher than average is associated with higher than average returns, since it means you are likely buying when the market is lower than the average level. When the VIX is between 30 and 35, as it is now, industrials, consumer discretionary, and energy stocks average returns over 40%, in the next 500 trading days. I should say that as elevated as the VIX is, we may have not seen the height of panic in the markets just yet. This is because aside from their military losses, the Russian state has paid an extremely high price economically. The EU, the US, Britain, and Canada quickly introduced sanctions against Russia. Russian banks are now excluded from the SWIFT payment system. Leading banks have been shut out of Western capital markets. Russian treasury bonds and bonds of some companies can no longer be traded. That makes it difficult for the Kremlin to refinance its debt. The West has frozen $85 billion worth of Russian assets and introduced travel bans. More than 500 people have been affected, including Vladimir Putin. Russia's access to computer chips, computers, and other high-tech products has been blocked. The latest sanctions sent the Russian ruble tumbling more than 30 percent, and the Russian central bank more than doubled its key interest rate to 20 percent. Some of the country's banks are expected to collapse, and analysts believe the sanctions will cripple the Russian economy for years to come. Not to mention Visa and MasterCard have recently decided to discontinue their network's services in Russia. Bitcoin now has a greater market cap than the Russian ruble. And if things continue at this pace, Dogecoin will eclipse the Russian ruble as well. The danger in this dynamic and why I think we may have not seen height panic in the market yet is that as Putin grows increasingly frustrated with the limited results his army has been able to achieve, which have come at an extremely high price, he may view these high costs as simply sunk costs that can no longer be avoided regardless of how he behaves moving forward and may decide to act even more recklessly. We've perhaps seen glimpses of this with Russia's recent attack on one of the largest nuclear power plants in Europe, which had the Ukrainians not withdrawn from, could have potentially caused a disaster greater than Chernobyl. This morning, growing fears of an unfolding nuclear disaster in Ukraine, where authorities say Russian forces attacked the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe. Cameras at the plant streaming the shelling of the facility live online. Please help us. A spokesperson for the plant says a nuclear accident could happen at any moment after Russian missiles fell directly on the facility, setting fire to one of its six reactors. That reactor is under renovation and not operating, but there is nuclear fuel inside. Experts say one of the biggest concerns, the plant's crucial electrical system. A fire could disable the cooling systems, uh, the electrical systems at the plant that could lead to a disruption of cooling of the highly radioactive hot nuclear fuel. 
and spent fuel. And if that cooling is not restored uh, within a matter of hours, you could potentially see a uh, reactors experiencing core melt accidents and potential releases of radioactivity. On this topic, I feel like perhaps I owe the viewer an explanation of my stance on this conflict, which is clearly pro the Ukrainian people and pro the Russian people, I should add, just against what the Russian regime has decided to do. You see, Islam is a very simple religion. You stand with the oppressed against the oppressor, always, regardless of how you feel about the oppressed or how you feel about the oppressor. There is a very clear hadith that gives this meaning. Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, said, help your brother, whether he is the oppressor or the oppressed one. To which a man asked, O messenger of Allah, I help him if he is the oppressed, but how should I help him if he is the oppressor? And the prophet, peace be upon him, said, by preventing him from oppressing others. So even if your brother is the oppressor, you have a duty to help him out by preventing him from being the oppressor and preventing him from oppressing others. Because ultimately, the oppressor is not only harming the oppressed, but they are leading themselves to ruin as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the just, will not allow oppression and injustice to continue indefinitely. By preventing someone from oppressing others and supporting the oppressed, you are sparing the oppressor from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will eventually befall them. Regardless of how you feel about the Ukrainian people, which I think if you have any ill will towards them, it's very misplaced. And regardless how you feel about the Russian people, which I think if you have any ill will towards them is misplaced. Governments make decisions, but people fundamentally are good. That said, regardless of how you feel about a people, as a Muslim, you stand beside the oppressed and you confront the oppressor always. Some people make it much more complicated for themselves and start asking, well, what about so-and-so and what about this other thing? They fall into whataboutism logic. These people are just confusing themselves. Islam, as I mentioned, is very simple. Whether you like the oppressor or you despise them. As a Muslim, the correct course of action is clear. You stand beside the oppressed against the oppressor always. This is how I think about it, at least, and now you know. The second headline is one that I made up, which is that Warren Buffett's investing style still works. Post-COVID, a lot of people wrote off Warren Buffett as a boomer that didn't get technology, whose investing style was no longer suitable for the modern economy. Kathy Woods, with her ARK Invest, investing in companies with zero income and high growth was the way of the future. Well, the truth is, each style of investing has its periods when it works optimally and others when it simply doesn't. Certainly at the outset of COVID, when the United States was printing money like there was no tomorrow, that was the time to go risk on to the max and that's when ARK's style really did well and Buffett appeared to be the out of touch boomer. Now that the market is experiencing elevated levels of anxiety, investors are going risk off and focusing on profitability and cash flows, Buffett's style is now outperforming ARK's investing style by a country mile. If you look at a comparison chart of the last year, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's fund, which is in the gray in this graph, is up 25%, whereas ARK-K, Kathy Wood's flagship fund, is down 50%. That's a difference of 75% in one year for those who are keeping score. The three-year comparison shows Berkshire up 63% and RK up only 34%. The five-year comparison shows Berkshire up 93% and RK up a whopping 160%. This is probably why every time Kathy Wood is pressed about her recent performance, she says her strategy will for sure work over a five-year time horizon and that investors should have patience. There are a number of lessons that investors can derive from this brief comparison. The first is that it makes precious little sense to invest in a fund based on the fact that they have done well recently, since outperformance is often followed by underperformance. 
you're likely going to do the worst as an investor if you're always looking for the hottest fund now since the payoff from a winning investment style is only experienced if you stick with it for long enough. The second lesson is that the time horizon for aggressive growth stocks needs to be a long one. If you want to invest in companies like the ones ARK K invests in, you better have a really long time horizon and a stomach for volatility. If you do, the payoff can be well worth it. Just make sure you're not buying at all time highs. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and leave a like, subscribe for more content like it, follow my crypto and stock portfolios by becoming a member. I'd say my style of stock investing is somewhere between ARK K and Berkshire Hathaway. I like growth stocks, I have a preference for them, but I do emphasize getting them at a reasonable valuation. So become a member if you're interested in following my portfolio. Until next time, Make sure to take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you all.